We hope you enjoyed this demo and we will uh, hope you sign up for the next two, which will be on June 25th and July 9th. And now, without further ado, please welcome your host, award-winning chef and author, Rocco Despierto. Hey there, Ron, thank you so much. Hey everybody, thank you for spending your afternoon with us here at the Downtown Alliance home edition of our Dine Around. Now for 19 years, the Dine Around was this fabulous event in downtown New York City where 50 or so restaurants from downtown area used to cook food and it was called a grazing event and uh, super fun for, and for obvious reasons. This year, we decided to move it to a home location. Uh, I hope you're all sitting comfortably and uh, if you're cooking along, we're gonna take our time and make sure you, you can catch up with us. If you're not cooking along, you can try the recipe in a few days. Uh, I'm really excited to partner with the Downtown Alliance and with our chef for the premiere episode. Uh, he is the executive chef of Delmonico's, one of the oldest fine dining restaurants in New York City, uh, 180 years old, thereabouts. You know, I, I stopped counting at 150. It's the first restaurant to, uh, to serve uh, with fi fine dining restaurant to serve with white tablecloths, printed menus. Um, it was also the first restaurant to uh, allow, uh, believe it or not, women to, to join on escorted. Uh, so a few, a few little fun tidbits there. Um, the chef is Billy Oliva. He's got a Michelin bib. Uh, he's been named best chef of the year in many of our uh, top food publications. Uh, and he's here to make a wonderful steak dish for us. He's also brought along some goodies that have been aging uh, since the lockdown. So he's gonna have some specimens for us to look at. Uh, please welcome Billy Oliva to the down, down, Downtown Alliance's Dine Around at Home. Billy, are you there? I'm here, guys. Rock Good. Um, thank you for having me, you know. I, yes, well, it's, a, it's, it's a pleasure. Uh, I'm glad to be cooking with you guys and I'm looking forward to it. Um, we're cooking in my kitchen, so it's, it's gonna be interesting. Um, as a chef, I, I don't do too much cooking at home, so it's always, uh, it's fun. I've had a lot of time now to cook at home. So we'll get started in a few minutes. Uh, and uh, when I cook at home, I try and do it as easy, as simple as possible, and a, as little cleanup as possible. Yeah, you want to you minimize that cleanup at home, that's for sure. When you don't have your whole team there, it's a whole different ball game. Every time I cook at home, I am uh, reminded of the fact that there's a lot of cleanup. I'm not. I'm sure you're one of those guys who uses every pot and pan in in the cupboard, right? I do the same thing. Yeah, and uh, uh, my wife hates it. <laughs> I hear we have uh, we have a little assistance from a family member today named Caitlin. I do. She's my camera person. So yeah, congratulations, Caitlin, getting a camera cre credit for you today. <laughs> yeah, she's going to be a big help. We do a lot of television, but never, like I said, never in my kitchen. So this is kind of new for us. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Delmonico's? I know I, I talked about a few of the highlights, but uh, it's got a wonderful history that I think you should share. Yeah, so Delmonico's, it's been in that location downtown, um, uh, South William Street, for uh, since 1837. Wow. You I can't even count that far back. Yeah, exactly. Uh, first restaurant to allow women to congregate. Uh, Eggs Benedict, Baked Alaska, Lobster Newburgh, Chicken Ala King, um, Delmonico Steak, all invented by a chef named Charles Reinhofer down in, in Delmonico's. It was also the first restaurant to use printed menus. Was, was the Peach Melba invented there or am I confusing it with, some, with another restaurant? High a la mode. A la mode, got it. Okay, what about, what about the chopped salad? Was invented. I don't know about the chopped salad. I had, what about I had pizza? It could be. Everything else was invented. <laughs> Spaghetti and meatballs probably invented down there, too. Anyway, it's a great place. Uh, you guys are going to reopen in the fall. We hope uh, some of you will not only cook along with Billy's recipes, but uh, visit Delmonico's in the fall. What are you making yep. for us today, buddy? So today we're going to start with um, a cowboy steak. Uh, excuse me, a cowgirl steak with a okay. cowboy butter and a roasted corn and shrimp salad. Very cool. Sounds delicious. Will you go through the steak cuts for us? I'm still confused by all the steak cuts. There's so many cuts of steak these days. So, so very cool thing. Where I was in the restaurant yesterday. I grabbed a piece of, uh, we talked about it earlier. I grabbed a piece of COVID-aged 
uh, ribeye being the fact that, um, <laughs> in, you know, we've been almost three months shut down. So we have steaks aging in our aging boxes that are, you know, close to 100, 100 days old. So I'm going to unveil this package here right now. And, and for, to- for those of you who don't know why we age beef, uh, we do it to concentrate flavor uh, for, to allow the natural enzymes in the muscle tissue to tenderize the meat uh, and, and enhance the flavor. There's literally a mold that grows around the beef that ends up enhancing the flavor quite a bit. Don't you, don't you think, Billy? Oh, absolutely. And, and it, it's, very, it's very unique to see. I mean, you could, uh, if you get ever a chance to smell a whole piece of dry beef with the fat on, and I left everything so you guys can see it. So what we have- Whoa, here, look at that. That looks like it's, this is so that's 100, 100 days total? This is 100 plus. This is wow. coming up close to almost 120. My and goodness. The smell is just like nutty, like roasted nuts and, and amazing. And, you know, when, you, when you're aging, you're, you're, you're breaking down the, the muscle fiber um, with the bacteria, the good bacteria. I, I trimmed a little piece earlier so you could see. So this, this, piece, this piece of fat here, and you take it off. And you can see how nice and red it is underneath there. Um, and like I said, we're going on close to 120 days with this. Um, and you can see you, you have a lot of loss. That's why some of the drying stuff is so expensive. As you, the longer it ages, it shrinks and it kind of, you get a really hard crust on the, on the outside and all that would get trimmed off. Um, and so the longer you age it, the more expensive it becomes. So Absolutely. when you go into steakhouses and they, they charge you crazy prices for a 100-day aged steak, it's because it's to mitigate the loss of weight. It actually reduces in weight because the water evaporates from it. So you, you yeah. start out with 10 pounds of beef, you end up with 8 pounds of beef. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the longer it goes, the smaller it gets. So this was... And the uh, more flavorful. Yep. Yeah. And the more flavorful. So that's, uh, that looks like a ribeye, a two-bone ribeye. Ribeye. Bone in ribeye with the spinellus here, still attached. Mm-hmm. It's shrinking. This was an end piece that I took. Um, and then we're going to get into, so I'm going to I'll start with the spinellus. So, so this is the spinellus. So this is the rib calf. And you can see it's got great marble. Um, and this actually kind of sits on top of the eye or kind of around the eye. And um, they take this off and you could, cook this, cut it into pieces, and cook it just, just the way that it is, a little salt and pepper. It's got a lot of marble, so a lot of nice, uh, a lot of nice flavor, a lot of nice richness to it. And these are all ribeyes, kind of, so the steak we're going to be cooking today, I'll show you real quick. This is called a cowgirl steak. Now, if you see this steak, the spinellus has been removed from this steak and typically there's a little bit more fat in here and trimmed up so they call the cowgirl this is about 16 17 ounces maybe 18 ounces this one um they call the cowgirl for that it's trimmed it's a little bit uh less fatty and nice kind of tight looking steaks got some good marble there and we're going to show you that and now here's a cowboy steak which you can see the spinellus, the, the muscle we just took a look at, which is still attached. And you can see the acorn fat is here. That fat, so, um, you know, fat tastes good. So this is always my favorite steak. Um, the fat kind of melts into the steak. And this is one of my favorites. So very similar. And still a ribeye. And then the last one is the big monster. This is a Whoa, tumble. look at that. So the bone is totally French. This is about 36 ounces. Bone is French. Again, the spinellus is left on. And you can see that big acorn fat is still there. So that's- And you can see that there are three muscle groups all, all colliding in that tomahawk. And yep. some, some ribeyes have three muscle groups. So the spinellus and the other two come together to make my favorite cut of the, of the six to you know, 10 cuts of the, the whole rib is where those three muscle groups come together. And then Billy, probably, I think a good idea to point out that that, that bone is usually where the meat of the short rib is attached. Correct. So when you order short rib, that, it's that bone there with all the meat attached. Correct, it's, it's at the kind of the opposite end of the eye of the rib. So um, 
Yeah, this is it looks, all... It looks amazing. It's probably, yeah. uh, well, that's about $600 worth of beef, right? Yeah, it's, it's up there. This is all dry age. Uh, with, yeah, even, I believe the spinellus even has some dry age on it. Amazing. Now, sometimes you'll see uh, Cote de Boeuf on the menu. And uh, for, for me, that's basically the same thing as that cowboy cut that Billy yeah. showed us earlier. Cote de Boeuf, the French term for, for uh, bone-in ribeye. And then when you go to a lot of restaurants and prime rib, I'm just going to get this guy on a plate. When you go to a lot of uh, restaurants and prime rib, it's basically the whole rib. You know, with this bone. That's right. A little bit. Same cut cooked, of meat. Cooked whole, cooked whole, right? Cooked That's whole, the big roasted difference. Whole, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, so so from one piece of meat, you have one, two, three, four, five, almost six different cuts. Amazing. I know there's hundreds of you out there watching and listening. If you have questions, please feel free to uh, type those in. We'd be happy to answer. Uh, Billy, Billy is a uh, master of beef and uh, could literally answer any question you can throw at him when it comes to cuts of meat. We'll do our best anyway. I'm just going to throw this back in the fridge and we'll keep going. Go. Okay. So, guys, so the, meat is, the meat has been tempering, right, Billy? Let's tell people about tempering. Yeah, so, so you never really want to, this meat has been out, out, I had it in the fridge, I put it back a little earlier, it was, was out. You always want to start with your meat at room temperature. Um, if you take the meat out of the fridge, it's cold. Uh, you put it into a hot pan, it just, it doesn't do anything good for the meat. Um, you know, it, it, it's harder to get a true temperature on the meat and the, the, the blood and the juices and the, it's just, it's just not a good idea to start with your meat coming straight out of the refrigerator. Um, so, 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 uh, super pro tip here, temper any meat before you cook it. And tempering means remove it from the refrigerator allow it to come to room temperature. So it'll go from 40 degrees in the fridge to about 65 degrees room temp. And at that point, you want to cook it, right, Billy? Yeah. You know, it just- You'll get a better crust. You'll get, get more flavor. It you know? relaxes more in the pan. I know that sounds funny, but it, it relaxes more in the pan. You'll get a better char. Um, you'll be able to, you know, if it's ice cold and you get that char on the outside, it'll still be raw. It could possibly be raw in the middle, you know? Um, because it's so cold, especially if you have a, a have a really good fridge that keeps things very cold, it, it definitely works against you. So for those people who are confused by doneness and cooking temperature when they're cooking beef, this will really help you know the real true doneness. Absolutely. When you touch this piece of beef, you'll be able to feel if it's rare or not. And guys, definitely uh, one thing. So, so with this whole um, COVID-19 thing going on, um, it was pretty hard for, for people at home to, to kind of buy the same quality of meat or the same. It wasn't, it wasn't always as easy. But now, um, I use Chef's Warehouse. I use Allen Brothers. Um, and they're all doing home delivery. They're all doing, um, you know, FedEx and UPS. So all this meat that, that, uh, that I have here today was sent from the butcher that I use in the restaurant directly to my house. You know, uh, next that's day. amazing. It's good. To, definitely good to know. So chefswarehouse.com, you can probably go there and uh, look up your favorite cut and get it delivered next day. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, we should also mention, Billy, that the, all funds raised uh, by this Dine Around at Home will go to support Delmonico's GoFundMe for uh, restaurant employee relief. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. So, so what we're doing is um, you know, we have a lot of guys that, that nobody sees, uh, a lot of uh, the porters, the dishwashers, the bus boys, those guys work really hard. Uh, you know, um, just a little extra help for them. That, that's well, where all coming relief is going to go to. I think we'll, we're going to post the link in the Q&A, so if you guys want to uh, donate, you can, uh, this is your opportunity to do that. So all, all the funds that come from Delmonico's, that come from you, will go to the Delmonico's Restaurant Employee Relief Fund. Help, help, help those guys uh, get back on their feet. It's going to be a few months until you reopen, so any, any help would be appreciated. And it's, yeah, it definitely would be, and it's really all the guys that, it's really all the guys that do the grunt work. Billy, we have a couple of questions. You ready for them? I'm ready. Cool. 
So Shiv wants to know what made, what made you want to become a chef? Was there a specific person that motivated you? Wow, so my story- Or demotivated you, I don't know. No, oh, so, so, so my story is kind of crazy. My dad died when I was about 12 years old. And um, my brother is 12 years older than me. And he was um, the general manager of Francis Tavern, which is also down in the financial district. So it was like, okay, I, summer was done. I was out with school. It was like, okay, what are we going to do with him now? My mom was working. And it was kind of like my brother said, well, I'll take him to work with me. And I remember the first day I was in the kitchen and I saw somebody flambe a pan. I saw a cook on the line, I saw Tay cook flambe a pan. And I said, that's what I want to do. And that's, that's where I've never done anything else. So you, you started out bottom, bottom of the rung at Francis Tavern. You saw cooks doing their magic and you were hooked. That's Very it. similar story for me. Very similar story for me. Yeah, dishwasher, pot washer. Francis Tavern even did their own laundry at the time. So I did laundry for two months. Do you remember the first time you cut yourself with the edge of a hotel pan? I do. As a dishwasher, <laughs> I remember it too. It happens to all of us. Those are very sharp. Uh, Peter Tracy has a question, Billy. Where's the best grocery store in lower Manhattan to get these cuts of beef? Wow. Um, the grocery store in Lower Manhattan, um, you know. Well, obviously I, there's Citarella, so the Citarella, to, right? When what, they reopen. Um, there is, what is that other store? I can't, begins with a Z. Um, Zabar's? You have Zabar's down there. That Zabar's is uptown, I think, right? There might be one downtown. Citarella's is on 9th Street and the West Village. Like I said, all these, all these, you know, can be Italy also. Line. Italy also, yeah. Uh, and yeah. again, yeah. you can, oh, you can go to. There. Yeah. And online, of course, at Chef's Warehouse. Yeah, and I'm trying to think where else. Uh, I'm not too familiar with all the supermarkets downtown. Only when we run out of something, and I have to run to the supermarket. I'm finding a lot of supermarkets uh, have ribeye now. They didn't always, but yeah. now they, they all seem to have ribeye now. It's a very popular cut. What are you going to make first, Billy? I think we'll start with the cowboy butter. It's pretty easy. All right. Let the, we're going to let the steak sit a little bit longer. And just real quick, so when you do order stuff, right, I mean, you see it comes neatly packaged. It, it can store in your refrigerator really well. I'm just going to stick this one back in the fridge. And then we'll bring over all the ingredients for the cowboy butter. So basically a, a compound butter, um, very easy to make. I always make extra because it's kind of hard to make, uh, kind of hard to make a little bit of this. And you know, it freezes really well. You could roll it in parchment paper to freeze it. You can put it in quart containers to freeze it. Um, and it's great. It's great on steaks. It's great on fish. It's just something good to keep, keep around. So we'll get For sure. Started. So this, I think the first one is maitre de hotel butter, right? Maitre d'hotel butter, which Correct. is usually parsley and shallots. And this, is, this looks and sounds like it's much more complicated, but super delicious. Look at all those ingredients. Yeah, just a, a lot of ingredients. <laughs> um, a lot of ingredients, not that hard, you know, not definitely not that hard. Yeah. Uh, so I just run through the ingredients first. So we have butter. That, obviously, I took this out. Um, I have some here as well that we let get soft. Uh, much easier to work with it when it's soft. You could do it in a KitchenAid. I'm not gonna do it in a KitchenAid today. Uh, mustard, Italian parsley, horseradish, um, some chopped garlic, shallots, uh, a little bit of chili, smoked, uh, uh, sorry, regular paprika, a little cayenne. I have some lemon juice already done here, some lemon juice. Um, a little bit of thyme, which I picked, which I have some over here as well. We'll bring some here to mess around with. Um, and again, the recipe I think is going to go up uh, online. Um, this, this, I, I try and do things, you know, um, in, in the restaurant, we follow recipes and they're exact and we want you to come to the restaurant and have the, the same experience every time. At home, 
I'm a little bit looser with the recipes. So if we have something, if we, you know, I'll use it. If we don't have something, I'll make do without it. Uh, so as we get started, I'll kind of, I'll kind of talk. So the first. All right, step, but so this is basically mix it all together, right? That's Soft it. Soft butter and, and mix it all together. That's it. Yeah, very simple. And you know, like I said, if, if you like horseradish, you could put extra. If you like mustard, you could put a little, a little bit extra. If you don't like mustard, you can put less or don't put it at all. Um, I'm always loose with, with. With this, I had a friend of mine that made this. Said he didn't have uh, he didn't have any horseradish, so he put a little cocktail sauce in it instead that he had in the fridge. That makes sense. Cocktail sauce has horseradish in it. It's got all kinds of wonderful flavors. Yeah. So so. It's and really and this will last can, in the freezer for months. Yeah, it's really something you can have fun with, and it's easy to easy to make. So we're gonna start. We're just gonna go run right down the list. I'm gonna zest just a little bit of a micro plane. Um, I'm just going to zest some lemon and uh, that's it. I'm not, um, my microplane I left in the restaurant, so I'm using this one that I had at home, which is not great. If you guys are unfamiliar with a microplane zester, it's, uh, it's now pretty ubiquitous. Uh, we, uh, we use it in professional kitchens all the time. This was a tool designed by a carpenter. He basically turned his carpentry and wood tools into chef's tools. And it's the best grater or zester for citrus because it allows you to peel just the oil soaked skin without any of the pith. Yeah, they, they are great. And this one that I have is not so great. That's but okay, I'm you can use a box grater. You could, uh, Billy, I've even just scraped, scraped the zest off with a paring knife. You yeah, know, you sometimes. Can do that and, yeah. And, you could do that and julienne it. I got a little bit in there, so I think we'll be good. And I got, I have lemon juice, so I'm not too worried about it. Can I add the lemon juice? And you could use a whip. You can use a, a spatula. I have my trusty uh, snowman spatula that I'm going to use today. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, I'm like the you know like the mechanic that never fixes his car. I'm the chef that doesn't have a whole lot of kitchen equipment at home. I'm never I know it's, am it's amazing uh, how ill-equipped I was. And once we uh, had to stay at home, I realized I'm, I'm not going to be comfortable cooking because I don't have any of my tools with me. So I've had to, ma I've had to make do and, and really uh, innovate. I've been using the same two pans for 110 days. And, yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy. I'll, an, I'll... An, old knife, an, old, uh, an old knife that I would never use in a professional restaurant. I'm the same way. So I'm going to measure this. Something that probably I, I would would not do if I wasn't uh, on television or wasn't on doing this live. I would just kind of dump it in. Uh, so that's about a quarter of a cup of mustard. And that's Dijon, right? That's Dijon, yep. Yeah. yeah, you want nice, strong Dijon for this, I imagine, Billy, right? Yeah, so there's a lot of flavor in this with the horseradish and the, the mustard and the chilies. I guess why they call it cowboy butter was because it had bold flavors and it was easy to do. Um, and it lasts a long time. So I'm just going to mix it to incorporate the liquid and the, the lime zest. And then we'll go with the rest of the ingredients. Uh, we'll put the horseradish in. Um, and again, I like horseradish, so I'm going to go a little extra. And we'll mix it. And it's there's not a whole lot. Like I said, this is this is pretty easy. If you stopped right there, it would already be so delicious. Yep. And we're gonna put our garlic in. Mm -hmm. thing. We're gonna put this is our cayenne. And I'm gonna just put that in. And we're gonna put our paprika. A tablespoon. We're gonna put our shallots and some of the stuff I measured and some of the stuff uh, I did not. But compound parts. butter is, is notorious for being made to taste, right? Obviously in yeah, a I mean, big busy I, restaurant, you need to have formulas to the gram, but at home you could be very, very uh, loose and easy I, about it. You know, that's, that's one thing and, and Rocco, I'm sure you be, you you would agree uh, one of the most important things in cooking right is is tasting as you go and, and adjusting as you go um and it's the same everything thing. 
And we have a little bit of chives that I'm gonna put in there. And like I said, this is great on fish. It's great on uh, steak, really great on steak. We're gonna put our the pepper flakes. I like heat, I'm a big fan of spice, so. So you're basically making a condiment that is, is held together by the butter. It's, yep. it's essentially, yeah, it's essentially stored in fat. And that's the reason it stays so good for so it's long. So well. And here we have some thyme and, and I have some, I took some thyme over from my window. And like, if you get fresh thyme, you could chop it or you could just kind of, I'll show you again, just peel it down. Um, again, at home, I'm not so fine in terms of, you know, chopping and, uh, and we just peel the thyme and get it in there. And if you don't like thyme, you don't have to use thyme. You could use rosemary. You could use, you know, um, you could use basil if you want to put basil. Um, it's all, all, I always want it to be up to what you like, especially when you're cooking it at home. Billy, there's a question. Are you okay with dry herbs if you can't get fresh? Um, for this compound butter, um, dry herbs. So, so the, the paprika we toasted a little bit in a pan um, ahead of time. Um, dry herbs, they, they, I guess they will work. I, I would prefer fresh. The fresh is just a vibrant, crisp, kind of clean flavor. But you can definitely use dry herbs. And there's another question, Billy. Do you use salted or unsalted butter? The butter was unsalted. And that's one thing I didn't mention, guys. I don't know if you saw me when I was doing it. I salted it as we were going, and I added a little bit of black. My pepper mill broke right before we started. So I have no choice. Instead of fresh pepper, we're using this today. Um, got it, got it. But unsalted but butter, and then season it as we go. Got it. Sure, yeah, I think I'm it's sure good to start with unsalted butter whenever you're cooking with butter, because you want to be able to control the salinity of the final dish. There's it, another yeah. question, Billy, about how are you going to cook the steak? Is it going to be in a cast iron pan? Yeah, so we have the cast iron pan here. This pan is so big, I have to keep it in my garage. I can't fit it in any of my pans. <laughs> um, so we have it here, and the whole time we've been, uh, we've been talking, I have it on a very low flame, so when we're ready to go, it's nice and hot. So guys, as you see, I have some that we made already here, and this is uh, what we just made now, and it looks pretty much the same. Looks delicious. Great. You know, it's got some good beautiful spots. orange color. Yeah. And um, like I said, good for a bunch of different things. So I'm going to get this stuff out of the way. Billy, the paprika you used was sweet paprika. Is that correct? Correct. Because Rose asks, Rose asks if she can use hot and sweet together or just the sweet. Hot and sweet. You know what would also be nice would be smoked paprika would be nice. A little pimenton. Good. Yep. Definitely use that. That would be great. Um, get a nice little smoky flavor out of it. Um, there was a lot of things. For, for this butter, I don't cook the garlic. If you wanted to put like charred onion in there as well, that would go really nice. There's, there's kind of it's kind of an open an open book you know once you get started so guys that's okay the pretty easy I, I i think pretty easy looks looks super easy and delicious and i think your point about making a lot is a very good point if you're going to make a, a pound why not make two or three pounds and just keep it in the freezer so what's yes. next billy pop it out so next we'll do the the, the corn and shrimp salad so i got okay. most Plots. Uh, most of the miso sauce is here. Um, I still kind of work like we're in the kitchen at, at the restaurant as much as I can. I don't know really how to work really any other way. So I'm going to bring all these ingredients so we can see them. So roasted corn and shrimp salad. Um, we, do, we did a variation of this in the restaurant as a side dish where we served it warm. This one, it's going to be cold, uh, so we'll run through all the ingredients. Obviously, we have some some roasted corn here, um, lemon juice, uh, excuse me, lime juice, some limes, avocado. This is some of the corn I prepped earlier. Red peppers, scallions, cilantro, red onion, um, garlic again, 
This is just a little chili powder um, that I like to add. We have a little bit of shrimp. So these shrimps were 1620s. We just kind of marinated them with lime juice, jalapenos, garlic, a little bit of cilantro, and then just sauteed them lightly in a pan and cut them into, into pieces. A little bit of mayonnaise, and this is a little bit of queso fresco here that we're going to use to, to finish it off. Um, and this is a cold salad, room temperature salad? Yeah, we're going to do a room temperature salad. Uh, especially like especially for me I don't want to spend all time in the kitchen where especially if I, I or when we get the, the chance to have friends over I want to be able to prepare it let it sit and then I can hang out and have a drink or have a beer when, when my friends I don't want to spend the whole time in the kitchen how long is the steak going to take to cook Billy uh the steak that steak I'm going to say probably my my pan should be pretty hot uh maybe seven to eight minutes on each side can we start that while we make the salad? Oh, we could. Are you okay we, with that? We could definitely start that steak and let it let it uh, let it rest for a while. There are a lot of questions about um, when to season the steak, how long to keep it out, what kind of what kind of pan to use, and I figured the best way to answer them all is just to watch you do it. Yeah, so we can start that right now, as a matter of fact. Um, so here is our cowgirl steak. And you know what, it's funny at the restaurant, um, at the restaurant, I'll put this here for a minute. At the restaurant, um, you know, we, we cook so many steaks, you know, we go through about, um, we probably go through about a hundred whole ribeyes a week when we wow. were in swing. Uh, you get about 11 to 12 ribeyes out of a steak. Um, so we sell a lot of ribeyes. So kind of, for us at the restaurant, it's almost, we look by color. We judge by the color of the steak and the feel of, of the steak. You know, um, when I was in school, um, you know, they, they teach you by the, the palm of your hand, kind of rare, medium rare, medium, medium well, well done. And if you feel down here, you can kind of judge for yourself. I still use that method. It's very yep. effective. <laughs> That was the Culinary Institute of America method. That's right. That's right. So, so there's some questions about seasoning. I can see you got you're going to season it very heavily with salt and pepper. We we season it very liberally with salt and pepper, figuring that a lot of it is going to fall off. Um, you know when we're cooking. Uh, again, it would be it would be just fresh cracked pepper. We don't use any fancy mix. Uh, if you have a good product, we don't like to mess with it too much. So it's just salt, we use kosher salt. Um, and in the restaurant, we would finish with sea salt. Um, I don't have any sea salt here, I forgot to bring it. So, and we're just gonna season it really liberally. And this pan should be pretty hot because I've had it more, uh, I've had it kind of heating up for a while. You see it's smoking. So super important, preheat the pan with no fat until it's raging hot. Then yeah. add fat and heat the fat up until it's smoking and then add the steak. Is that correct? Pretty much, that's what we would do. Uh, you can see that pan. I'll make sure, oh, I thought that was a fire alarm for a minute, but I said it can't be. Um, yeah, so uh, the pan is smoking here. And you know, if you're not sure, you can always test it and you wanna hear that sizzle. So I'm actually gonna let it heat up just even a little bit more. Yeah, you want a, you want a very sort of strong reaction between the oil and the steak. You want to hear sizzling, feel water blistering and spraying into the air. That's water evaporating. You really want to um, you really want to hear it, and that's you know cooking is is taste, touch, feel, smell, hear. It, it's kind of activates all your senses. So why that pan is getting even hotter, and it's a good thing I disconnected my smoke alarm. Um, well, There's actually a question about that, Billy. I don't want to. I don't want to advocate for disconnecting your smoke bar, but um, I had, you know, I've done that once or twice while cooking at home because in uh, as as uh, who asked the question? Let's see. In small New York City apartments, it's very difficult not to cook. Oh yeah, this is an anonymous anonymous person. Uh, in small New York City apartments, it's very hard to cook that uh, cook 
properly without setting off a smoke alarm. Yeah, in my apartment as well. So uh, I disconnect it while we're cooking. Uh, you know, always make sure you have, you know, what one thing, if you ever do start a, a fire in the pan, please don't throw any water in the pan. That's yes, very, very important. important, yeah. If there's a fire in the pan, turn off the heat. Uh, something that works really well, and we use it in the restaurant if there's ever flare up. If you have kosher salt, you throw some kosher salt in the pan, it'll put the fire out pretty quickly. But today we're going to try not to start any fires because my wife would be pretty upset about that. Um, so, Chef Zachary has asked, how long before you cook the meat do you need to season it with salt and pepper? What's your take? Um, we season it kind of right before we, we, we cook it. There's kind of two trains of thought on that. Some people say that um, if you cook the meat, if you season the meat too early, that the salt will actually start to pull out the moisture from the steak and um, could make it a little dry after it's cooked. So we do it, we do it kind of a little bit, you know, a few minutes before. That's, that's what, what we like to do. I, I couldn't agree more, but if you season it too far in advance, you'll end up with a soggy exterior and you won't get the Maillard reaction and, and the crust that you're looking for. And going to all, you know, all the effort that you did to make sure the pan was hot will just be wasted. So I'm going to start here. I think we're, we should have, sounds a little bit better. Oh, beautiful sound. This pan is very heavy, so. Now, the reason we use cast iron is because it's uh, a heavy, uh, thick iron pan that will retain a lot of heat. Yeah, and, and there's very little oil we used here. Some people will start with almost no oil at all because there's a lot of fat on the meat. It's up to you. A little bit of oil, I think, goes a long way. Billy, we have about 15 minutes left. Can we make the salad while the steak oh, is Oh, yeah, let's, let's do this. So we'll, we'll get... We'll get going. So one thing I like to do with a cold salad is just lightly cook these. So we're going to cook the peppers and the onions and a little bit of the garlic because where the butter, I didn't cook the garlic in the salad. I'll cook it just so you don't have that raw garlic flavor because the butter you're going to melt. It's going to be cooked. Um, so we're just going to cook this. We don't want to really put any color on it. We just want to soften up the vegetables. We'll go kind of quick here. And guys, just to, to show you, the corn was roasted in the oven about 350, 400 degrees um, for about half hour or so. We peeled it. That's what it kind of looked like after it was cooked. And then here we have the finished product. So I'm just going to dump that into the bowl. So you shave the kernels off the cob? Yeah. With you a knife? Um, not too. If we get a, if we have some time, I will definitely uh, show you guys how to do that. The vegetables are cooking. The steak. Wow, you can really hear that. Hear that sizzle. All that sizzle means flavor. The more the sizzle, the more flavor. Sometimes you want to add a little bit of fat to make sure that the, uh, the heat is transferred from the pan to the meat. So that's, that's why Billy just added more fat. Exactly. And this pan is almost too big for my stove. So the vegetables, we, like I said, a, a, light, a light cook on the vegetables, light. Just want to sweat them out, cook the garlic a little bit. And then we'll, I'm just going to, Set these for a second to cool down. I mean, you could cool them in the refrigerator. I don't want us to run out of time here. So I'm going to let those cool real quick. So you, you would call that a sweat, not a saute, right? Yeah, more of a sweat. We just want to soften the garlic, take away some of that bitter, that bitterness that, you know, dark raw garlic can have. And um, we'll take a look at this steak. So we're getting Billy, some, Billy used olive oil, right? Uh, I use, question. So I use a vegetable oil. We usually, typically in the restaurant, we would use a canola blend. Got it. Uh, 
here my wife likes to cook with avocado oil so i use oh avocado. great terrific yeah yeah so are you going to finish this with some butter basting or are you going to or another way we are we definitely are so okay I, I had these ingredients so i had cilantro or we had scallions we had jalapenos i'm going to add some cilantro so this is the shrimp that we talked about earlier that we cooked basically with the same seasoning that we use for the corn. That's gonna go in. Um, I'm gonna use a little bit of lime juice here because we wanna make sure we get everything. We have some mayonnaise now. So as you can see, I haven't messed with that steak too much. Let it sit, let it sit, let it sit. Don't move it around. That's what every chef will tell you. Do not touch the steak. Let it sit. We want to let it char on as much as possible. Um, Michelle yeah. Gilbert asks, how far in advance can you cook the shrimp? Um, I cook those maybe about a half hour. Um, I cook those maybe about a half hour before we did this. But if you're going to make it cold, you could cook it in the morning so you have less work to do, you know? Um, and again, just a little olive oil. And we're going to just kind of put the mayonnaise is in here. And the last thing we'll add is uh, we're going to add some chili powder and a little bit of avocado. And then the, the cheese will kind of grate over the top of it. Um, this is kind of a take on a, on a kind of like Mexican street corn with the mayonnaise, the chili, uh, the, the lime. So the avocado, I'm going to kind of cut it in half with my knife and then twist it. And then we're just going to kind of cut it in the, in the, in the. So you're going to cut it right in, right in the skin and then pop it out? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I like to use a butter spreader to get it out in, uh, and it comes, it, it pushes it out perfectly. One of those little old school butter spreaders. Okay, have an offset spatula. This avocado, the avocados in my store today were not great. They were a little, uh, not too ripe. But we'll get that out. And so Billy, this is a side dish on the menu at Delmonico's or a salad? Um, this was a side dish. We did it a little bit different, uh, a little bit different in the restaurant. There was no avocado in it and we served it warm. But Got it. Okay. Same ingredients minus the avocado, and it was served slightly warm. I think it's okay to improvise. If you have avocado, you should eat them. They're either not ready or they're going bad. So if they're ready, eat them. Exactly. So I think we have everything in here. That looks amazing. So we'll season it. Um, so the main the main uh, dressing is mayo in this. Get mayo, a little lime juice. So we just flip the steak. We have a. Oh, a, wow, look at that. And I'm going to take here. Now, you could. I'm just going to use some plain butter here to start basting. And um, we could use the, the cowboy butter, but some of the ingredients in the cowboy butter would burn. So that's why I don't always use the cowboy butter. So we're going to let that butter melt. And as you can see, I'm not shy about the butter. And then over here on my windowsill, I have a little bit of rosemary. And a little bit of thyme. So you're going to use, you're going to use a, using uh, window box rosemary and thyme? Yeah. So we're going to let that cook. Once the butter melts, now we'll just kind of. So this is a this is a place where if you're going to use butter to baste and finish the steak, the kind of oil you use to start it with is not as important. Uh, the butter will ultimately lend its flavor as it yeah, browns to the steak. Exactly. You know the canola oil, like I said, in the restaurant is well used because it has a higher burning point than a lot of the other oils. 
the when the pan is hot. Um, I'm gonna slide this sort of over here so you guys can see better. Billy, is this something you make for your family? Um, I do, believe it or not. Um, and it's funny, considering the restaurant I work in, my wife only it doesn't eat meat um, all the time. She eats meat sometimes, very rarely. Only when I cook it at home, she'll eat it. She'll never order it. Out. Smart, smart choice, I'd say. So, It's a nice treat to have a chef make a perfect ribeye at home for you. What's your favorite thing to make at home other than steak? This is a question directly from Bianca. Wow. Um, so I grew up with an Italian-American background. My dad was Sicilian. So, you know, every Sunday was pasta. Back then, when I was a kid, it was macaroni, you know? It was, we had macaroni, you know, uh, rigatoni and sauce every yes. Sunday. Yes, yeah. You know, so, so I love to eat pasta. I would eat pasta probably seven days a week. If I, I love cooking pasta at home as well. I never eat it when I go out, but when I'm at home, I love to cook. It's so much fun. Makes everybody happy. It's super easy, really inexpensive. One of my favorites is carbonara. Very oh. easy to make. I'm just going to... I'm going to transfer this. And again, you know, the steak, everybody... Uh, Everybody has their own, you know, if you like it rare, you cook it rare. If you, if you like it medium rare, you cook it medium rare. If you like it well done, cook it well done. You know, it's all, you know, how- I find that when you're cooking for a mixed audience or, you know, a large group, cooking it medium usually makes everyone happy because yeah. the ends will be a little more cooked and the center will be a little more rare and that usually uh, doesn't upset anyone. But uh, a ribeye like that is really good at medium rare, medium rare plus 120 degrees or so. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Hey, Chef, Joseph Hawk wants to know why the Bake Alaska doesn't come out flaming anymore at Delvonico's. <laughs> Do you want to answer that? Well, so we, uh, it, it, it became kind of a health and safety issue. Yeah. If you. And kind of it, not allowed to have fires in the dining room anymore. That, that's one of the reasons. And the second reason was, and this is just a little bit of a case of pretzel that I'm going to kind of crumble on top. The second reason was um, consistency. To, to really keep that, uh, to really keep it consistent. Um, when you flame it in the dining room, you, you often don't get... Um, you often don't get that that even nice golden brown color. You get some charred burnt bits on the ends, and sometimes the fire doesn't go out. And also because you know we have some waiters that have been in the restaurant since 1837, so I don't want to set anybody on fire or anything like that. <laughs> Shiv wants to know what kind of butter are you using? Um, it's the same unsalted butter, just with a little right. rosemary and thyme in it. And I'm actually gonna set the burner off now. So I just turned the burner off. Um, so normally we would let this rest at this point for five to 15 minutes. Uh, you can tent it to keep it warm. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna be signing off in a few minutes, so we may not have that luxury, but uh, this is, uh, resting the steak is definitely worth the effort. It yeah, changes, that's changes that's the result 100%. Definitely makes it worthwhile. Um, it, it, it lets the, the juices flow back into the center of the steak and um, it lets, uh, you know, the, the, the muscles relax a little bit. And, um, you know, if you, we were to cut this right now, it would all bleed out and it would turn pretty much well done rather rapidly. So we're going to let it sit here for a minute and then. Uh, what I'll do is I'm just going to put a little bit of corn on the plate while we're waiting and we'll give it a slice. I wish you guys were here to, to actually eat some steak with us. I, I know I'm dying to be there. I haven't eaten all day. I need, I need a bite of that steak. It looks so good. What kind of wine would you serve with this? Josh oh, Minter's asking. 
So, I mean, Eddie Red, uh, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big California Red guy. I love Cabernets. Uh, but I have to be honest with you, at the moment, I'm drinking, uh, I've been on kind of a, and I might even eat it, drink it with this tonight. I've been on a rosé, a, a rosé kick lately. Rosé is, uh, it's summertime, man. Rosé is Yeah, perfect. exactly. It goes it's, with it's, everything. It's summertime and, and definitely goes great. You know, the, the, the brightness and the, the acidity in the, in the corn, the, you know, Aperol Spritz is also in my mind, which was yum, so good. So uh, it's a little bit, it's a little bit on the, you know, I would like to let this rest a little bit longer, but I know we're pressed for time. I can tell it's killing you to cut this right now. I can feel it. You really don't want to cut it right now, which is great. Those chef instincts are strong. But look at how beautiful it is. That's looking great, man. And you look know, at that it, doneness. It's 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 kind of right there if it would have had a chance to rest another second would have been would have been even it better it looks perfect it looks perfect chef trust me and what's I, what's I, really cool is it's got that great coast to coast doneness it's rare from coast to coast from yeah. one end to the other no bullseyes i'll pull piece out we'll pull piece Look right at out that, my goodness oh and one thing i'm just gonna take a quick Uh, I wish you guys to were taste. Here. Important to taste. I wish you guys were here. But and, and, and the again, cow cowboy butter goes on now. Oh yeah, good thing we almost forgot about that. <laughs> what one of our uh, attendees just reminded us. That was so. In the restaurant, we pipe it out, um, and you know we always finish the steaks in the restaurant. We finish the steaks with dry aged beef fat and um, melted butter, equal parts. So for this steak, it's just gonna be the cowboy butter, and I'm not gonna be fancy about it. Um, and we just kinda let it melt. Oh, that looks incredible. Looks really then, good. A little bit yeah, of salt. So the dry, aged, the dry aged beef fat is something a lot of chefs love to do while you're trimming your beef. Uh, if you have some fat, just put it in a pan and let it melt. And then later yeah, on, you can you can season your steak with it. And and that's it. I mean, that's going to be my dinner later. Beautifully done, Billy. Beautifully done, Chef Billy Oliva from Delmonico's reopening in the fall. Been open 180 plus years. We want to see that go another 180 years. Remember, Bravo. any donations go to the uh, GoFundMe for Delmonico's uh, and back of the house employees. And uh, we have another one of these dine rounds coming up on June 25th. Don't forget to register for that. It's uh, sponsored by the Downtown Alliance. I'll be there for that one as well. Uh, we'll, we'll post a link to the registration for that. Billy, you cooked, the, uh, under duress, you cooked that steak perfectly. We were the running out of time. Perfect. Rocco, can I just say one more thing before we go? Yeah, of course. Um, so I, the one, two people I'd like to thank. I'd like to thank Milan Lacool and Bronco Tersonovi. Those are actually the owners of Delmonico's. And um, these guys have been through 9-11, um, the stock market crash, Hurricane Sandy, and now we're facing this. And they're working kind of as hard as they can to, to, to get us back and to, so, I can, so I can start cooking for everybody. So I just want to thank them for all their hard work. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think people realize how difficult it is to keep a restaurant going one year, much less 180 years. And unfortunately, yeah, even, a lot of our brothers in the business are not coming back. Uh, yeah, it, and it's, it's uh, so we're really happy to, to hear you are. It's horrible to see. So let's thank the Downtown Alliance as well. They've been around for 19 years. Uh, we're going to do, be doing these all summer. We're looking forward to the next one. Looking forward to coming to you in the fall, Billy. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, for, thank you for preparing this delicious ribeye. Um, and uh, on June 25th. I'd like 25th, to thank Shelly also. Shelly put a lot of heart. Shelly Manejit, for sure. Yeah. Shelly and everybody at the everybody downtown put a lot of hard work into it. And don't forget Caitlin. Caitlin's yeah, phone is probably yeah, burning. We wouldn't be let's doing this her, without her. Let's give her a moment on camera. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> How do your forearms feel? 
I think I'll have great muscles. <laughs> <laughs> it's like doing a plank for an hour long. <laughs> please follow, uh, please follow Ron Oliva. I mean, sorry, follow Billy Oliva on Instagram. Uh, I think it's Chef Billy Oliva. Uh, yeah. At, at Chef Billy Oliva. I'm at Rocco Despirito and uh, Downtown Alliance is at Downtown Alliance uh, for more news about upcoming events. We just posted the link to the next event. We hope to see you guys there. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for spending your afternoon with us. We appreciate all the love and the enthusiasm. And yeah. uh, we'll see you, you soon. Thank you, Thanks Chef. Thanks, everybody.